Bible is full of very many precious promises to give us encouragement. One of those is found in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5 when Jesus was giving His Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what are the meek going to inherit? The promise is that they will inherit the earth. We're not just going to some place up in the sky, some nebulous place. We are going to actually come here to this world once again and inherit the earth. But before we can inherit the earth, there's something else that needs to take place. Let's look at John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. These were some verses that Jesus gave just as He was about to depart from His disciples. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Jesus is going to come again. And when He comes again, after a while, we're going to have the inheritance of this earth. Now it's not going to be this earth as we have known it today. It's going to be a different kind of earth. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. Nevertheless we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth, a place where we can spend eternity together with our Lord. Now, it seems that this time has long delayed. We look in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it may seem that the delay has been a long time. We th think that, oh, since my grandfather's days, they were talking about the coming of Jesus. Yes, they have been talking about it for a long time. And we may think, oh, that's been such a long delay. Well, we even say, oh, it's been delayed since back in 1888. And somehow we even find statements. And it seems that the delay has been even since 1844. But did you know something? The delay has actually been longer than that. The delay has been much longer than 1844. Jesus has been waiting for a long time to come again to give us the inheritance of a new heaven and a new earth. But you know, we are waiting for specific reasons. Jesus is waiting till He has a people that are ready to inherit that earth. And this is why it says here in this verse, He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, in order for us to understand how long has been that delay, and in order for us to understand why there has been that delay, we want to study a little bit about some of the promises that were given to our father Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, and verse 7, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7, it speaks about Abraham being the father of all the faithful. Galatians 3 verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So we are actually children of Abraham. He is the father of all the faithful. But he is only a father to those who are faithful. Because in John chapter 8 and verse 39, John chapter 8 and verse 39, Jesus tells us who are the children of Abraham. John 8 verse 39, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So who is the child of Abraham? Only those that do the works of Abraham. And we saw that in our first video of the series. So to be a child of Abraham, we must do the works of that man, Abraham. 
Now in our first video of the series, we did not go into this particular aspect of the promises given to Abraham. We went more into this aspect, who are the children. But now I want to emphasize those promises that were made to that man. Sometimes we only mention the spiritual promises and we overlook the literal promises that were given to God's people to encourage them on their heavenward journey. So let us look at that very first promise given to Abraham. The literal promises now. Well, we know that there are spiritual promises, but we want to look at those literal promises that were given to him. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. This is when Abraham was called to leave Ur of the Chaldees. Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Mori. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord unto, appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So what did he promise him? He said, Unto your seed I am going to give this land. So as Abraham was looking at the land all around him, yes, this tangible earth, God says to him, I am going to give this land unto you. This land was promised to Abraham's seed. Because here in these verses it says, Unto thy seed will I give this land. This promise... Abraham repeated once again when Isaac was about to get married. Except this time he repeated something else about that promise. Genesis 24 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 24 and verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, he shall send his angels before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. So he was talking to his servant to go out and find a wife for his son, Isaac, who is going to also inherit this land. Now, as we have studied previously, it was not only specifically the children or the descendants of Abraham, but this seed of Abraham was actually someone in particular. Let's read it once again in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, And not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So all these promises that were given to Abraham's seed was specifically in reference to Jesus Christ. And this promise that was given to him was not only of the spiritual inheritance, but it was specifically the inheritance of that land. Now this was not only given to Abraham, seed, specifically being of Christ, but it also referred to someone else. Let's look at Genesis chapter 17 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So what is the promise here? The promise is here, not only I am going to give the land to your seed, but who else? It says, I am going to give the land unto thee. And there are many other verses in the Bible which specifically identify that the promises are going to be given not only to the children of Abraham, but also to Abraham himself. I'd just like to read one more, Genesis 15, verse 7. Genesis 15, verse 7, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So the promise was given not only to his children, but also specifically to Abraham. This was also given to Isaac, the same promise, and the same promise was given to Jacob. Later on when he spoke of that promise in 
Genesis chapter 35, Abraham was included as one who was going to receive these promises. Genesis 35 verses 10 through 12. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall thy name be called. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thee. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee will I give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So the promise here is he's talking to Jacob, and he changes his name to Israel. He says that the land, I gave this land to whom? To Abraham. So I have a question for you. If God promised, which he did, he promised the land to whom? Specifically, he gave the promise to whom? First of all, to Abraham. So, the promise was given to Abraham of the land. Then, the same promise was given to Isaac. The same promise was given to Jacob. And, we know from Galatians 3.16, that the promise actually was given specifically to Jesus Christ. So, I have a question for you. If Jacob receives the land, is the promise fulfilled to Abraham? Is that the fulfillment of the promise? If maybe one of the children of a Jacob have it, is that the fulfillment of the promise? No. If the promise of the land was given to Abraham, then Abraham himself must possess the land. So the next question that we may legitimately ask ourselves is, was this promise ever fulfilled to Abraham? Did he receive that promise? Did he inherit the land? Well, let's look at Genesis 37 and verse 1. Genesis 37 and verse 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. So what does it say? Jacob went ahead and he dwelt in that land. So Jacob dwelt in this land... But what was this in this land? His father Isaac was a stranger. It was not his land. Are you a stranger in your own place? No. If you went to your own house, you don't consider yourself a stranger there. Oh no. Isaac was a stranger because he was dwelling in a strange land. Jacob also was a stranger. And Abraham, what about him? Did Abraham own anything in that land? Was that land given to Abraham? Well, in Genesis 23, I'm not going to read those verses, but when Sarah died, Abraham went to bury Sarah. And when he went to bury her, he had to purchase the land. The land was not his. He had to buy the land. Tell me something. When you inherit the land... Does that mean that you paid something for it? No. When you paid something, you don't say, Oh, I inherited a house. No. You said, I purchased a house. And so it is here. Abraham did not inherit that cave. Abraham bought that cave. And when Stephen was being stoned in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, verses 2 and verse 5, he describes clearly what the experience of Abraham was. Acts chapter 7, verse 2. And he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And now down to verse 5. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Can you believe this? He did not give him any inheritance. So according to Stephen, back there in the New Testament, what happened? Abraham received no inheritance. He did not receive even enough inheritance to put 
his foot on that. So therefore we see very clearly that Abraham never received the inheritance of the land. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 39, after giving the list of all the faithful people right down from the very beginning from Abel and all these other faithful men down through the ages, including David and others. It says in verse 39, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They did not obtain the promise. So, was this fulfilled or was it not fulfilled? Obviously, it was not fulfilled. Actually, God told Abraham that he was not going to see the fulfillment of this in his lifetime. Let's look at Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 15. Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 15. And he said unto Abraham, Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So what did God tell Abraham? God told him, you Abraham are going to die. And before you die, you are not going to receive this land. And your children... Oh, they're going to go into captivity even, and they're going to be coming out in the fourth generation. Matter of fact, they're not going to see the promises fulfilled until 400 years later from now. That's a long time there. But this was what God told Abraham up front. So how could he receive this land if he was going to die before it happened? Well, keep in mind that in order for this promise to be fulfilled, both Abraham and his seed must occupy the land of promise. If only Abraham occupies it and his seed does not, that's not fulfilled. If his seed receives it, but Abraham does not, then it's still not fulfilled. Both must fulfill, be alive to receive that land. And keep in mind again, in Galatians 3.16, what did we read? We read that Jesus was also, He is the main one that is to inherit that land. So without Jesus, there is no inheritance. And for that matter, how much land are we talking about? How much land really was promised to Abraham? Was it only that little stretch there that they're fighting over? Even today in the news, almost all the time in the news, you hear a little bit about some peace trying to be made between Abraham's descendants. They're still fighting over that little piece of land called Palestine. But the promised land that was given to Abraham, we find in Romans chapter 4 verse 13. Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Notice here, the promise that he should be the heir of, not Palestine only, but what? But he should be the heir of the whole world. That's right. That new heaven and that new earth that we were talking about in the very beginning, that was the promise that was given to Abraham. And Abraham was to inherit that new world and not only to Abraham but his seed now who are his seed let's look at Galatians 3 verse 27 through 29 for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bound nor free there is neither male nor female for you're all one in Christ Jesus and if ye be Christ then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in reality, when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, it is at that time that we become heirs of the promises given to Abraham. 
And just to be able to summarize these promises to Abraham, I'd like to read from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 169 to 170. Patriarchs and Prophets, 169 to 170. The heritage that God has promised to His people is not this world. Abraham had no possession in the earth. No, not so much as to set his foot on. He possessed great substance, and he used it to the glory of God and the good of his fellow men. But he did not look upon this world as his home. This world was not his home. He did not look as this place. Oh, this is my place. No, he looked for another world. The Lord had called him to leave his idolatrous countrymen with the promise of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Yet neither he nor his son nor his son's son received it. When Abraham desired a burial place for his dead, he had to buy it of the Canaanites. His sole possession in the land of promise was that rock-hewn tomb in the cave of Machpelah. But the word of God had not failed. Neither did it meet its final accomplishment in the occupation of Canaan by the Jewish people. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Abraham himself was to share the inheritance. The fulfillment of God's promise may see, seem to be long delayed, for one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. It may appear to tarry, but at the appointed time it will surely come, it will not tarry. The gift to Abraham and his seed included not merely the land of Canaan, but the whole earth. So says the apostle, the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And the Bible plainly teaches that the promises made to Abraham are to be fulfilled through Christ. All that are Christ are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. The earth freed from this curse of sin. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to go to that land? Well, the, first you must be a child of Abraham. You must accept the promises and the responsibilities that are given to the children of Abraham. And then and only then can you inherit these promises. I want to be there. And I hope you want to be there as well. Now God told Abraham back in Genesis 15, that he was going to die before these promises would be fulfilled. But he also told him when these promises are to be fulfilled. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 15 once again. Genesis chapter 15, and I want to begin with verse 13 once again, and then read on down to see that these promises were intended to be fulfilled at a specific time. Genesis 15, let's begin with verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So during this 400 year period of time, Abraham was to die. So Abraham was then to die during that time period. He was not going to live for that whole entire 400 years. But, verse 16, but in the fourth generation, so you go through four generations, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So why couldn't Abraham inherit that land right then? Why was it? Well, there was several reasons. One of them is that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. The Amorites still had time for their probation. And then, at the end of 400 years, their probation was closed and then Israel would come in. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So at this point in time, when God spoke to Abraham on this occasion, he entered into this and made this 
possession of land a part of the covenant. Before God had spoken to him and made this as a promise, but now he entered into a covenant relationship with Abraham. And this promise of land became a part of that covenant relationship with him. So the promise of land was not merely a hope in some distant future. It was actually 400 years. They were to come. And in that covenant was what? The promise they shall inherit the land. Now I want us to go to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. You know the story there, the beginning of Exodus was the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 6, we begin with verse 11. Moses had now come back out of the wilderness. He had been taking care of sheep now for 40 years. And he now comes to the elders of Israel and he's going to convince them that it is now time for them to go into something. Let's read. Let us turn to Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Exodus 6, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. What does it say here? It says that God is going to deliver Israel from Egypt. He is going to redeem them and take them out from Pharaoh. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. What did it say here? They were, I have established my covenant with them. And what did that covenant include? It included the possession of land. Now notice verse 5 and on. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Oh, what does it say here? God now says, I remember my covenant with them. And what was the covenant? Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, verse 6, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from the bur under the burdens of the Egyptians. And now this verse is very key here in our understanding. Verse 8, And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, and I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Notice here, he says, Now is the time. I am going to give you this land. This land will now belong to you. You are actually going to inherit it. Now he told that to Abraham 400 years earlier. He said, I am going to give you this land. When? In the fourth generation. And so those 400 years pass. And in the exact same day that God said that 400 years from now this is going to happen, what happened? Israel was on their way out of Egypt and on their way to an inheritance of the land. But remember, the promise is not fulfilled if these people inherit the land alone. Abraham has to be there. Isaac has to be there. Jacob have to be there. Now, how can they be there if they are in a grave? How can they be there to possess that land? Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10 give us an important key. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10 show that Abraham and these others, their hope was not for the earthly Canaan. 
Hebrews 11 verse 9 and 10 says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles as Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. They were not looking for the earthly. They were actually looking for the heavenly. They knew they were going to die in this world and that they were not going to see the promise fulfilled. So their eyes were upon the heavenly city. Their eyes were upon the heavenly Canaan. Their eyes were upon a new heaven and a new earth. Now, wait a minute. In this context, what then was Abraham looking forward to? He was not looking forward just to live a long time in this earth. He looked forward to a new heaven. He wanted to be there throughout all eternity together with Jesus. And so when the promises were given that he is going to inherit the land then, what does it mean? Well, it means only one thing. That in the time of Moses, they were expecting the second coming of Jesus. That's right. They were expecting to not only go to that land of promise, that temporal land, because that was never their hope. They were hoping for the eternal promises that were given by God. In this context, in the context that they were about to enter the promised land, it was in this prom context that God gave Israel their diet that was to prepare them for translation. You see, after the previous two studies, you saw the plan that God had. And in this study here, we see why God planned for them to have a special diet. And not only the special diet, there were many other things that God had for them. But what happened? Why couldn't those people participate in that? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19. Why was it that all these promises were unfulfilled to them? Why? Verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They did not have faith. They refused the conditions that God had given them. So when God gave them their diet, and not only their diet, but that was our study in the last couple of videos. But God gave them their diet. What did they do? They refused that dietary plan of God. And because they refused it, they could never fulfill the purpose that God had in store for them. Therefore, what happened? They died in the wilderness. Two men of 20 years old and upward were able to enter the, enter the land of Canaan. And even then, what happened? Instead of developing that into the promised land, they were destroyed and they were dispersed throughout the nations. That was the result. Remember, we read in Ministry of Healing, page 311. Ministry of Healing, page 311. In choosing man's food in Eden, the Lord showed what was the best diet. In the choice made for Israel, He taught the same lesson. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt and undertook their training that they might be a people for His own possession. Through them He desired to bless and teach the world. He provided them with the food best adapted for this purpose, not flesh, but manna, the bread of heaven. It was only because of their discontent and their murmuring for the flesh pots of Egypt that animal food was granted them, and this only for a short time. Its use brought disease and death to thousands. Yet, the restriction to a non-flesh diet was never heartily accepted. They never accepted it with their heart. It continued to be a cause of discontent and murmuring, open or secret, and it was not made permanent. And since it was not made permanent, they never were able to reach the ideal that God had in store for them. Now what lesson is there for us 
in the book, Volume 1, Selected Messages, page 69. Volume 1, Selected Messages, page 69. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins. Which sins? The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. That's right. That's why we are here for over 150 years. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow for so many years. So the delay of Christ's coming was not since 1888 or since 1844. No, it was since the days of Moses. That's how long the delay of the, of the new heaven and new earth has been going on. And why? It is because the people that were chosen by God, they refused the conditions that were given them. Now, since they were about to enter the promised land, God wanted them to have the new earth established in their time. Therefore, God gave them the diet for the new earth. When they rejected it, they could not enter in. Now, what about those of us living in these last days? What about us who are living in these days and we are supposed to be the modern Israel ready to go to heavenly Canaan? What about us? Well, it is the same sins that are giving us those problems. The same sins are keeping us right here. So this issue of diet, is it important or is it not? Why is it that we make it a test of fellowship? Well, we saw that it was a test of fellowship among the children of Israel. When they rejected it after light was given to them, they perished in the wilderness. And when they insisted on rejecting it and introduced flesh foods once again, the pot of manna was removed and they never reached the plan, the eternal inheritance that they intended. So, what are we going to do today? Now, it's amazing how history repeats itself. In the book, Councils on Health, page 153, Councils on Health, 153, it talks about a large class of people and how they act. It says there is a large class who will reject any reform movement, however reasonable, if it lays a restriction upon the appetite. So a large group of people, what do they do? As soon as there is a restriction to their appetite, and there is a reformation on that point, they reject it, they oppose it. So notice here, there is a large class who will reject any reform movement, however reasonable, if it lays a restriction upon the appetite. They consult taste instead of reason and the laws of health. By this class, all who leave the beaten track of custom and advocate reform will be opposed and accounted radical. Let them pursue ever so consistent a course. And therefore, this is one of the sins that are hindering modern Israel from entering heavenly Canaan and delaying the second coming of Jesus. In Christ Object Lessons, page 69, Christ Object Lessons, page 69, says, When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own. What is the reason for the delay? It is not because we haven't preached the third angel's message throughout the whole world. It is not because the world is not wicked enough yet. The reason is because we as a people have delayed the coming of Jesus. We are murmuring and complaining just like the Hebrews were there in the wilderness. Is there a time for a reformation among us? Yes, it is high time for you and me individually to reevaluate our lives and ask the Lord to give that change. This is why the points that we have learned as we've been studying the pot of manna are so important for those of us who are living in a time when the climax of all the ages is about to take place for God's church and our need to be ready, including that which concerns our diet. But having said this, why do we make this issue a test when the Spirit of Prophecy in Volume 9 specifically stated that 
this vegetarian diet should not be made a test of fellowship. Why is it? Before we go directly into those particular paragraphs in the spirit of prophecy, I want us to look at a couple of other points related to some other subject, and then we'll apply the lessons on this particular point. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. You see, brethren, there is something in the Bible that is called present truth. Although many things are true, yet present truth is of important value for us. In Great Controversy, page 143, Great Controversy, page 143, speaks about the importance of this present truth. Opposition is the lot of all whom God employs to present truths specially applicable to their time. There was a present truth in the days of Luther, a truth at that time of special importance. There is a present truth for the church today. So in the days of Martin Luther, there was a present truth in his time. Yes, it was important in his time. But there is also a present truth for us today. Now, it mentioned Martin Luther. Well, let us consider this great man of God. Was he a man of God or was he not a man of God? Well, we all recognize he was a man of God. Was he faithful till he died? Yes, we all recognize that. He was a man that began the Reformation in the, in the uh, 16th century. But, did he keep the Sabbath? Was he a Sabbath keeper? No, he was not. We all recognize he was not a Sabbath keeper. Well, did Martin Luther have light on the Sabbath? Did Martin Luther know and understand the Sabbath truth? Many people tell me, oh, Martin Luther did not have the light. Oh, but I beg to differ. Martin Luther had the light on the Sabbath. Let me read to you from this book, History of the Sabbath by John Andrews. On page 460, I'd like to read a couple of paragraphs here. History of the Sabbath by John Andrews, page 460. And here's a statement here about Karlsdatt and Luther. It says, Karlsdatt differed essentially from Luther in regard to the use to be made of the Old Testament. With him, the law of Moses was still binding. Luther, on the contrary, had a strong aversion to what he calls a legal and Judaizing religion. Karls that held to the divine authority of the Sabbath from the Old Testament. Luther believed Christians were free to observe any day as a Sabbath, provided they be uniform in observing it. So Karls that was teaching that the Sabbath must be observed. And Luther was saying it doesn't matter which day you keep, so long as all Christians keep the same day. Now, from the words of Martin Luther himself, we find that actually Martin Luther had to study the writings of Karls that in order to say that the Sabbath should not be kept. On the same page, a little bit further down, we read from Martin Luther's own words, Indeed, if Karls that were to write further about the Sabbath, Sunday would have to give way, and the Sabbath, that is to say Saturday, must be kept holy. Martin Luther recognized it. Martin Luther, as he was reading the writings of Karls that he would say, well, Karls that is not going to stop at just saying the Sabbath is right and we should keep Sabbath. But if he was right in his writings, then we'll have to say that Sunday is wrong. And Martin Luther was not about ready to do that. You see, he understood what Karls that was writing. He would truly make us Jews in all things, and we should come to be circumcised. For that is true and cannot be denied that he who deems it necessary to keep one law of Moses and keeps it as a law of Moses, must deem all necessary and keep them all. Well, he was taking things a little bit too far. Martin Luther was. But he understood the reasons for the observance of the Sabbath. So then, why do we consider him the man of God? When he rejected the Sabbath. He rejected the light on the Sabbath. Why is it that we still consider him a man of God? Well, it's quite simple. 
in the book, Early Writings, page 42 to 43. It makes something very clear, Early Writings, page 42 to 43. I saw that the present test on the Sabbath could not come until the mediation of Jesus in the holy place was finished and he had passed within the second veil. Therefore, Christians who fell asleep before the door was opened into the Most Holy, when the midnight cry was finished at the seventh month, 1844, and who had not kept the true Sabbath, now rest in hope, for they had not the light and the test on the Sabbath, which we now have since that door was opened. Oh, what is it? Notice these two points. We find that prior to 1844, what happened? Christians did not have what? The light? Well, but they did have the light because the light was there in Carl's that time. Matter of fact, I think it's 1812 or 1814 that the, the General Conference of Seventh-day Baptist was organized. That's right. As in, right in the early part of the 1800s. In 1844, when all the turmoil was going around in the churches about the second coming of Jesus, the Seventh-day Baptist General Conference voted and approved that there be a special day of fasting and prayer that these Christian churches would accept the Sabbath. So, there was light before 1844. But it says here, and. And what does and mean? It means these two are, must be combined together. The light and the test. So, in 1843, if you made the Sabbath a test, you were premature. It was too early. There was nothing wrong with that light, but it was premature. It had to take place after 1844, when they had both the light and the test. Only then could you make that a testing point. So those people in the days of Martin Luther, like Carl's dad, who was making it a testing point, they were premature in their judgment on this issue. Furthermore, how do we know that 1844 was that date? How do we know? Well, by prophecy. As we study the prophecies, we read that it was in that time that the Ark of the Covenant was to be revealed in heaven and the law was to be revealed to God's people. So there was to be a restoration since 1844 in that area. Prophecy is very important. Many times we do things prematurely because we misinterpret prophecy. The Jewish people till today, their problem is they messed up on prophecies. They have taken the second coming of Christ, put it for the first, and had no room for the first coming of Christ. And therefore, till today, they're still waiting for Jesus to come again the second time. Well, the same thing happens on this issue of diet. We must understand when we are to make it a test and when we are not to make it a test. For example, in 1844, the pioneering Adventists... They were good Adventists. Let's put 1845. They've gone through the great disappointment. They were ridiculed by all the churches. And they were God's remnant people. As God's remnant people, they were worshiping on Sunday. That's right. It was not until 18. 46, 1847, and finally 1848 that they actually understood the Sabbath to be a point of distinction. But now let's go a little bit further. What about in the year 1858? What kind of people were Seventh-day Adventists? At this time, by the way, they had no name Seventh-day Adventists that did not come until later on. But in 1858, what light did they have in regard to the diet question? We may think, oh, well, they could eat clean meats. Well, actually, let's read a statement. Volume 1, 
page 206 to 207. Volume 1, 206 to 207. And this was given by God. And what was given by God? Let's read it. Those who labor with their hands must nourish their strength to perform His labor. And those also who labor in word and doctrine must nourish their strength. For Satan and his evil angels are warring against them to tear down their strength. They should seek rest of body and mind from wearying labor when they can. And should eat of nourishing, strengthening food to build up their strength. So what should they do? They should eat good, nourishing food to build up their strength. For they will be obliged to exercise all the strength they have. I saw that it does not glorify God in the least for any of His people to make a time of trouble for themselves. There is a time of trouble just before God's people and He will prepare them for that fearful conflict. So there is a time of trouble coming and we should not make a time of trouble prematurely. And we need to be able to eat good nourishing food. Now what kind of good nourishing food does the prophet say we should have? Notice the next paragraph. I saw that your views concerning swine's flesh would prove no injury if you would have them to yourselves. But in your judgment and opinion, you have made this question a test and your actions have plainly shown your faith in this matter. So what happens there? In 1858, she said, we must have good nourishing food and one of those good nourishing food is pork. That's right. The prophet says, pork is good nourishing food. And in your judgment, you have made pork eating a test. Amazing. That was the year, 1858. So to be a good Seventh-day Adventist in 1858, you kept the Sabbath, but you ate good pork. It was good nourishing food. It goes on. If God requires His people to abstain from swine's flesh, He will convict them on this matter. He is just as willing to show His honest children their duty as to show their duty to individuals upon whom He has not laid the burden of His work. If it is the duty of the church to abstain from swine's flesh, God will discover it to more than two or three. He will teach His church their duty. So, when individuals were making the issue of pork a test, it was premature. Was there anything wrong with their doctrine? No. The only problem was it was premature. In the footnote, James White wrote this, and you find this in the footnote on that same page. He wrote, This remarkable testimony was written October 21, 1858, nearly five years before the great vision of 1863, in which the light upon health reform was given. When the right time came, the subject was given in a manner to move all our people. How wonderful are the wisdom and goodness of God. It might be as wrong to crowd the milk, salt, and sugar question now as the pork question in 1858. So when would that time come? When would the time come to give up pork? We know, biblically speaking, that God never gave permission for His people to eat pork. But they were blinded. They were coming out of Egyptian blindness. Remember, we left Egypt in 1844. They were coming out of Egyptian blindness. And God was educating His people. And when would it be a time to say pork is no longer the food for God's people? Well, we read the next paragraph, volume 1, page 207. God is leading out a people, not a few separate individuals here and there, one believing this thing, another that. Angels of God are doing the work committed to their trust. The third angel is leading out and purifying a people, and they should move with him unitedly. Some run ahead of the angels that are leading his people, but they have to retrace every step and meekly follow no faster than the angels lead. I saw that the angels of God would lead His people no faster than they could receive and act upon the important truths that are communicated to them. So God is going to reveal Himself to His people as fast as they are able to understand it and bear it. But some restless spirits do not more than half do up their work. As the angel leads them, they get in haste for something new, and rush on without divine guidance. 
and thus bring confusion and discord into the ranks. They do not speak or act in harmony with the body. I saw that you both must speedily be brought where you are willing to be led instead of desiring to lead, or Satan will step in and lead you in his way to follow his counsel. Some look at your set notions and consider them an evidence of humility. They are deceived. You both are making work for repentance. Can you believe it? These brethren were making work for repentance and they were telling people not to eat pork. Imagine that. That was a Bible doctrine. But what was wrong? The wrong was the timing. It was premature. It was only as God's people were able to bear that light that that became a testing issue. In Volume 2, Testing for the Church, page 96. Volume 2, page 96. This paragraph gives the important reason when pork was to be made a testing issue. God has given you light and knowledge which you have professed to believe came direct from Him, instructing you to deny appetite. You know that the use of swine's flesh is contrary to His express command, given not because He wished to especially show His authority, but because it would be injurious to those who should eat it. Its use would cause the blood to become impure, so that scrofula and other humors would corrupt the system, and the whole organism would suffer especially with the fine sensitive nerves of the brain become enfeebled and so be clouded that sacred things would not be discerned. That's right, sacred things would not be discerned, but be placed upon a low level with the common things. So God knew that. So sacred and the, and the common would become similar. Notice this, light showing that disease is caused by using this gross article of food has come just as soon as God's people could bear it. Have you heeded the light? So when did the light come? Only when God's people were able to bear it. When they were unable to bear it, then it was premature and they were told they need to repent of that message. In the year 1905, in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 313 to 314. Ministry of Healing, 313 to 314. Talk again about swine's flesh. The tissues of the swine swarm with parasites. Of the swine, God said, it is unclean unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcasses. This command was given because swine's flesh is unfit for food. Swine are scavengers, and this is the only use they were intended to serve. Never, when? Never under any circumstances was their flesh to be eaten by human beings. When could human beings eat it? Never under any circumstances. It is impossible for the flesh of any living creature to be wholesome when filth is its natural element and when it feeds upon every detestable thing. So we'll, we have learned some very important lessons in regard to the use of swine's flesh. Although we are clearly told not to make this point a test, back in 1858, there was a time when it must become a test. That's right. There comes a time when it must become a test. That time came when the people of God were able to bear the light. When they were able to bear it, then God gave them the light for their own benefit. It was not to punish them, it was for their own benefit. At that time, when the light did come, God revealed it not just to one or two, but He revealed it to His church. And they then, as a church, took action. So what about the statement then in volume 9 that meat eating is not to be made a test of fellowship? Let us read it. Volume 9, Testing for the Church, page 159 to 160. 159 to 160. It says, We are not to make the use of flesh food a test of fellowship, but we should consider the influence that professed believers who use flesh food have over others. So this statement may seem very clear, 
We are not to make the use of flesh food to test the fellowship. Well, that statement in volume 1 was also very clear. It said that you are in great error in making pork eating a test. So then, what about this statement? Is there a statement ever to show that it ever is going to be made a test? Well, let us take a look. Volume 9, page 163. Keep in mind that this next statement that we are about to read, volume 9, page 163, is in the exact same article. So keep in mind, when it says on page 159 to 160, we are not to make the use of flesh food to test the fellowship, in that same article, not in a different one, but in that same article, we find this statement on page 163. While working against gluttony and intemperance, we must recognize the condition to which the human family is subjected. God has made provision for those who live in the different countries of the world. Those who desire to be co-workers with God must consider carefully before they specify just what food should and should not be eaten. We are to be brought into connection with the masses. Should health reform in its most extreme form be taught to those whose circumstances forbid its adoption, more harm than good would be done. As I preach the gospel to the poor, I am instructed to tell them to eat that food which is the most nourishing. I cannot say to them, you must not eat eggs or milk or cream. You must use no butter in the preparation of food. Now notice this last sentence here. Notice this carefully. The gospel must be preached to the poor, but the time has not yet come to prescribe the strictest diet. What does that say? It says the time has not yet come. It does not mean that the time will never come. It says the time has not yet come. Now, why did the prophet write this? Why? A little bit digging to find out the background of this statement. I find some very interesting information in the volume 6 of the Ellen G. White biography. Volume 6, Ellen G. White biography, page 199. I know there are many statements here to excuse what she wrote, and I specifically look at her own statements in here. But I'll read a little bit of their own background as well. It says, on March 29th, 1908, she had penned a letter to e Elder A.G. Daniels, President of the General Conference, relating to the experience of church members in Washington, D.C. After expressing her agreement with plans for the erection of a meeting house in Tacoma Park, she pointed out the responsibility of the believers and workers in Washington to witness to the thousands of residents in that area who had not yet heard the third angel's message. Workers were to bring to mind the words of Christ, Ye are the light of the world, ye are the salt of the earth. Then under a subsetting of backsliding and health reform, she wrote, and here's what we read. This is what she wrote at that time. This article became the article in volume 9, but with some modifications. She modified it herself. But why? I want us to look at the original intent that the prophet had before this statement was given that we are not to make the use of flesh foods a test of fellowship. Here's what it reads. I am instructed to bear a message to all our people on the subject of health reform. For many have backslidden from their former loyalty to health reform principles. The light God has given is being disregarded. A true reformation needs to take place among the believers in Washington on the matter of healthful living. If the believers there will give themselves unreservedly to God, He will accept them. If they will adopt 
in the matter of eating and drinking the principles of temperance that the light of health reform has brought to us, they will be richly blessed. Those, listen to this, those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh meats, tea, and coffee, and rich and unhealthful food preparations, and who are determined to make a covenant with God by sacrifice, will not continue to indulge their appetites for foods which they know to be unhealthful. God demands that the appetite be cleansed and self-denial be practiced in regard to those things which are not good. This is a work that will have to be done before His people can stand before Him, a perfected people. So this work must be done when? Before His people can stand before Him, a perfected people. And now this next paragraph is important. This paragraph was changed when she entered into dialogue with the brethren there in Washington, especially with Elder A.G. Daniels. It says, The Lord has given clear light regarding the nature of the food that is to compose our diet. He has instructed us concerning the effect of unhealthful food upon the disposition and character. Shall we respond to the counsels and cautions given? Who among our brethren will sign a pledge to dispense with flesh meats, tea and coffee and all injurious foods and become health reformers in the fullest sense of the term? You see, she wrote in that letter to A.G. Daniels, to those people, to the leaders right there in Washington, D.C., who among them was willing to sign a pledge in which they will refrain from the use of flesh meats, tea and coffee and all injurious foods and become health reformers in the fullest sense of the term. Near the close of the letter of appeal, she wrote the following here. Here's what she writes. I am sure if you will begin in Washington to do this work of reform in the school, in the printing office, and among all our working forces, the Lord will help you to present a pledge that will help the people to return from their backsliding on the question of health reform. And as you seek to carry out the will of the Lord in this particular, He will give you clearer understanding of what health reform will do for you. Because of the example set by influential men in the indulgence of appetite, the truth has not made the impression on hearts that it might have done. I appeal to you now to set an example in self-denial. Cut off every needless indulgence that God may bless you with His approval and acceptance. So what happened? She sent a letter to Washington, D.C. in 1908. Appealed for the leadership of the church to sign a pledge that they will refuse to use flesh, tea, coffee and other injurious foods. That's what she wrote to them. Now, a little bit further here. This is not Ellen G. White's statement now. Ellen White held the letter for a few weeks, then sent it in late May 1908. Copies were sent at that time to the several members of the General Conference Committee. Dr. W. A. Rubel, Secretary of the General Conference Medical Missionary Council and a member of the General Conference Committee who was promoting health reform interest in the denomination sought permission almost immediately from Mrs. White's office to duplicate and circulate the letter. So what did he want to do? He wanted to immediately take this letter and circulate the letter. Oh, but you read on. A.G. Daniels got a hold of that and he says, because it was addressed directly to him, and he said, wait a minute. You don't understand the situation of people all around the world. You need to be more understanding. And that was not circulated. And it was in this environment when the leadership of the church refused to even sign the pledge among themselves that we came, that she had to write the statement, we are not to make the use of flesh food to test the fellowship. Why not? It cannot be done. How can you make a test of fellowship to a new member when the general conference leadership is not prepared to sign the pledge? It is impossible. But she did write in that article, let me read it one more time, volume 9, page 163, 
The gospel must be preached to the poor, but the time has not yet come to prescribe the strictest diet. So I have a question. Between that time and the second coming of Jesus, is there going to be a time to make flesh foods no longer a part of God's remnant people? Well, from what we have studied, the children of Israel never made it because they refused that diet. And they refused other things, but also they refused that diet, which prepared them for all the other points. What about God's remnant people in our last days? Is Jesus going to come or is He not going to come? Well, let's take a look at some other prophecies. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 407, paragraph 2. This was written in 1884. We are built up from what we eat. Shall we strengthen the animal passions by eating animal food? In the place of educating the taste to love this gross diet, it is high time that we were educating ourselves to subsist upon fruits, grains, and vegetables. This is the work of all who are connected with our institutions. And here's what she wrote. Use less and less meat until it is not used at all. If meat is discarded, if the taste is not educated in that direction, if a liking for fruits and grains is encouraged, it will soon be, as God in the beginning designed it should be, no meat will be used by His people. What? We are to do what? In 1884, we are to begin a process of using less and less meat until what? As a people, it says, no meat will be used by His people. Are you one of those people? No meat will be used by His people. In 1890, 1890, Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 119. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 119. Again and again I have been shown that God is trying to lead us back step by step to His original design, that man should subsist upon the natural products of the earth. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. So 1890, meat eating will eventually be done away. Meat eating will eventually be done away. Among whom? Those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord. 1898, Councils on Diet and Foods, 411. Councils on Diet and Foods, 411. The Lord will bring His people into a position where they will not touch or taste the flesh of dead animals. So, 1898, come to the point where His people will not touch or taste the flesh of dead animals. Who? His people. 1899 Council on Diet and Foods 384 to 385 The light given me is that it will not be very long before we shall have to give up using any animal food. 1899 Give up using any animal food. That's right. God, let me read it again. The light given me is that it will not be very long before we shall have to give up using any animal food. Even milk will have to be discarded. If we'll even have to give up milk, what about flesh of animals? If we have to give up even the milk. Disease is accumulating rapidly. The curse of God is upon the earth because man has cursed it. The habits and practices of men have brought the earth into such a condition that some other food than animal food must be substituted for the human family. We do not need flesh food at all. God can give us something else. Does this mean 
that no meat at all will be used by God's people? Is that the intention of these statements? Well, let's go back to 1884. Again, another prophecy. See, these are all prophecies. We are not to look only at the current situation. Like in the days of Martin Luther. You don't look at only the current situation. We must progress. We must go on unto perfection. And we do that not by how our desires, but by the prophecies that are given. And here's what it says. Councils on Diet and Food, page 407. Councils on Diet and Food, page 407. A positive injury is done to the system by continuous meat eating. There is no excuse for it but a depraved, perverted appetite. You may ask, would you do away entirely with meat eating? That's a good question, isn't it? Are you going to do away totally with meat eating? We're not going to have any meat at all? Well, what is the answer? Would you do away entirely with meat eating? I answer, it will eventually come to this. But we are not prepared for this step just now. What does it say here? It will eventually come to this, but we are not prepared for this step just now. Meat eating will eventually be done away. The flesh of animals will no longer compose a part of our diet, and we shall look upon the butcher shop with disgust. Now these are very important prophecies. You know, the person that picks up volume 9 and says, Oh, but she says, meat eating is not to be made a test of fellowship. Well, which, which book are you going to pick up? Volume 9 or Volume 1, it says, pork eating is not to be made a test of fellowship. Well, brethren, we must understand that it was not to be made a test of fellowship then because they were not prepared for that step just then. And the same way, later on, pork eating was made a test of fellowship when that became, when the people were ready to accept that light. And what about the issue of flesh foods altogether? Well, when you look at these statements, 1884, no meat will be used by his people. 1890, meat eating will be eventually be done away. 1898, his people will not touch or taste the flesh of dead animals. 1899, will give up using any animal food. And finally, 1884 again, would you do away entirely with meat eating? I answer, it will eventually come to this, but we are not prepared for this step just now. All I have to ask is, who are God's people? Who are those people that are going to bear that ark? Who are those people that are carrying the pot of manna? Are you one of those people? We often talk about the second coming of Jesus. Oh, we want Jesus to come soon. Do you? If you do, there must be some changes on our part. In 1905, Medical Ministry, page 281. Medical Ministry, 281. We shall soon reach a time when we must understand the meaning of a simple diet. The time is not far hence when we shall be obliged to adopt a diet very different from our present diet. So, 1905, obliged to change our diet. What do you understand by the word obliged? Is obliged meaning a requirement? Or is obliged meaning an option? Again, why was it not time for meat to be made a test of fellowship? Well, we read there what was happening in Washington, D.C. Now, I want to read from Councils on Diet and Food, page 390 to 391. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 390 to 391. And this is from a general conference bulletin. We want the pervading truth of God's Word to get hold of every one of our people before this conference is over. What was it take place? Before that general conference was over in 1901, we want the truth of God's Word to, to get a hold of our people. We want them to understand that the flesh of animals is not the proper food for them to eat. Wait a minute. Who is she talking to? In the General Conference Bulletin of 1901, she is talking to General Conference delegates. 
And she's appealing to the delegates to what? That they should understand that flesh of animals is not the food they should eat. Brethren, if the delegation in session is still eating meat, are you going to sit there and tell the member, oh, you want to join our church? You cannot eat meat. But we are delegates. We can eat meat. Is that what we're going to do? No. The Reformation must begin where, did we read? Among the ministers. And as such, the Reformation on this dietary question needs to begin at the General Conference among those delegates and ministers before you make it a test of fellowship. And therefore, when she circulated a pledge and those ministers refused that pledge, then you could not make it a test of fellowship. General Conference Bulletin, 1903. God gave the light on health reform, and those who rejected it, rejected God. That's right. So, in 1901, appeal was made not to eat the use of flesh of dead animals. 1903, those who rejected that light actually rejected God. In Volume 13, Manuscript Releases, page 339. Volume 13, Manuscript Releases, page 339. If church members do not act the part God has assigned them, the movement of health reform will go on without them. And it will be seen that God has removed their candlestick out of its place. So if health reform is being moved on without them, then we find that the candlestick has been removed out of its place. I mentioned the one about the ministers. Let me read it at this point. Volume 1, page 469 to 470. Volume 1, 469 to 470. The ministers must be converted before they can strengthen their brethren. They should not preach themselves, but Christ and His righteousness. A reformation is needed among the people, but it should first begin its purifying work with the ministers. One important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform as it stands connected with the third angel's message as part and parcel of the same work. They should not fail to adopt it themselves and should urge it upon all who profess to believe the truth. So we find here that the problem has been with the ministry. The ministry is holding back the truth. They refused to adopt health reform. Therefore, it could never go down to the people like it should. We often talk about, oh, we're giving the third angel's message to the world. Are we? If we do not give the health message clearly, are we giving the third angel's message to the world? When it says it is part and parcel of the same work? In volume 6, which was written in 1900, page 327, the gospel of health has able advocates, but their work has been made very hard because so many ministers, presidents of conferences, and others in positions of influence have failed to give the question of health reform its proper attention. They have not recognized it in its relation to the work of the message as the right arm of the body. While very little respect has been shown to this department by many of the people and by some of the ministers, the Lord has shown His regard for it by giving it abundant prosperity. When properly conducted, the health work is an entering wedge, making a way for other truths to reach the heart. When the third angel's message is received in its fullness, health reform will be given its place in the councils of the conference, in the work of the church, in the home, at the table, and in all the household arrangements. Then the right arm will serve and protect the body. So then, the statement that was written in 1902 found in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 401 to 402. Council on Diet and Foods, 401 to 402. After all the light that was given to the people, after the light was given to the ministers, there's a question. Can we possibly have confidence in ministers who at tables where flesh is served join with others in eating it? Can you have confidence in a minister who eats meat? Brethren, this is a question that was inspired by God. God is asking this question to us. 
Can you trust a minister who still eats meat? On the other hand, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27. Speaking about his church. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Is this the church that God wants? Yes, it's going to be a church without blemish. Now what must happen before we can stand before God a perfected people? Volume 9, page 153 to 154. Volume 9, 153 to 154. Those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh foods, tea, and coffee, and rich and unhealthful food preparations, and who are determined to make a covenant with God by sacrifice, will not continue to indulge their appetite for food that they know to be unhealthful. God demands that the appetites be cleansed, and that self-denial be practiced in regard to those things which are not good. This is a work that will have to be done before His people can stand before Him, a perfected people. So this change in the diet, this refusal of flesh foods and other harmful things, including tea and coffee, these things must be refused by God's people as a people before they can stand before Him as perfected people. That means that it must happen before Jesus comes again. It must happen before Jesus comes again. We talk about receiving great light. Do we want great, greater light from God? Do we want that light? Testaments and Ministers, page 507. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Do you want greater light? Then you must accept the light that God has given us on this subject. In conclusion, I want to read a few statements as we come to this conclusion. Volume 2. Tyson for the Church, page 70 to 71. Volume 2, 70 to 71. It is a duty to know how to preserve the body in the very best condition of health. And it is a sacred duty to live up to the light which God has graciously given. If we close our eyes to the light for fear we shall see our wrongs, which we are unwilling to forsake, our sins are not lessened but increased. If light is turned from... In one case, it will be disregarded in another. It is just as much sin to violate the laws of our being as to break one of the Ten Commandments, for we cannot do either without breaking God's law. So if we violate the laws of health, what are we doing? We are actually violating the Ten Commandments. We read earlier in Volume 5, page 76 and 70 to 78, Volume 5, 76 to 78. We read about God having a people who were bearing the ark, but something sad took place. It says, When God shall work His strange work on earth, when holy hands bear the ark no longer, woe will be upon the people. Yes, there may be a people who refuse the pot of manna. They refuse to bear the ark on this point. But what shall we do? Shall we give up? No. Testimonies of Ministers, page 411. Testimonies of Ministers, page 411. Satan has laid every measure possible that nothing shall come among us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our errors. But there is a people who will bear the ark of God. Praise the Lord. There is a people. God has a people that are on this earth a people who bear the ark of God, a people who will take this health message and carry it to the ends of the earth. I have a question for you. Are you among that people? Are you among those people who have made this decision to prepare for the second coming of Christ?